Can you guys hear me now? Yeah. Okay, great, great. How you doing, everybody? Um, a lot of you guys know me as uh, Immortal Technique. My name is Felipe Andres Coronel Moreno. Um, I was born in Hospital Militar de Lima in Peru. Um, and I immigrated to the United States in uh, 1981. Um, as uh, a person, an immigrant who came from a Latin American country that was devastated economically, um, I'm looking at what's happening now in a way that many of us from immigrant communities in Latin America can. We understand something that other demographics in this country don't, and that's inflation. The rise and fall of all monetary currency, how it affects all of our people, how it affects especially the working class people and those individuals that uh, have no papers that are being persecuted because they don't have the ability to connect with those resources. So during this time, um, I took my artistry um, and I took like some of the funds and I started um, helping out whatever organizations I could, um, moving towards trying to create um, more activism inside, um, hip hop and through channels of music and through touring around the world. But I think that, you know, there's a lot of complications with revolutionary politics, you know. Like I remind my brothers and sisters that are here that our revolution didn't start with a leftist ideology that was taught to us by white Americans here or even by so-called Latino people in Latin America. You know, our revolution began in 1492 when uh, slave masters came here and legalized rape and pedophilia. And what we have to accept and something that helped me and my sister helped me to G-check a lot of my own like bullshit machismo and, and made me realize, you know, when we talk about so-called Latino people, we're talking about people who are the product of a rape, of a mass genocide and a mass rape of the culture, of the resources, of our understanding of that, you know, and that's reinforced in a lot of ways in our, in our society. And I think that's why the music I have became popular. You know, I wasn't uh, a guy who was on the radio all the time because I didn't have the, the desire to do the payola thing for that. So instead, I focused a lot on touring. So I've been to every continent on the planet except Antarctica. And what I found is that our people are in so many different places. And I say indigenous people, Latino people, I've met displaced individuals all over Scandinavia that escaped the Pinochet regime. You know what I mean? And then I have to consider the balance of, of what, um, what the, the politics of our people really is in this country, you know? And the, something interesting that I noticed and I, I, I really took note of because I have a lot of religious family members is that unlike other conservative groups, like uh, whether they're African-American conservatives or white conservatives, I met a lot of conservatives from those, that, that, those demographics that are non-religious people. But when it comes to us, I've noticed that it's like 99%, I have very, very difficult to find a Latino person that is not, uh, uh, that is a conservative, that is not aligned through them through a, a, a religious uh, model. Now, when it comes to the neoliberal side of what we deal with, I, I know a lot of well-meaning people that want to work within a system to change it. I can tell you personally that you can find plenty of examples where that's just stifling and used to buy off people. But it's the best that local politicians have that try to make a change in their community. The only problem is I think that there are various um, strategies to use against electoralism. You know what I mean? And, I, and I'm sorry that electoralism is just one of them. But really, you know, when it comes to leftist politics, I, I have to make a brutal observation that, you know, Karl Marx, I, I read the book, I, I, 1850, you know, I, I appreciate that. Um, there's some interesting concepts in there, but what I always remind my brothers and sisters is that we didn't need a white man from Europe in the mid 19th century to come to the dark jungles of uh, Africa and Latin America to explain the complex concept of sharing. We knew what collectivism was for thousands of years. I think when you analyze a lot of the, the civilizations that fell victim to the Spaniards, uh, whether it was the Aztecs, the Mayans, or the Incas, my people, a lot of it had to do with their belief in a theocratic society. The fact that we, that's undeniable. No, no matter how evenly more some of those resources were played out, 
when you look at a lot of those societies, it was a firm belief in that. And we still hold those traditions. Like I'm, I'm, I'm very a person who grew up appreciating the indigenous ancestry and appreciating the fact that, you know, my, my grandfather had African ancestry. Unlike other people that I've met, who unfortunately, like, I will be honest with you, I, I know a lot of, of homies and when they talk like that or they say things that I, I always say, neg eso negro asqueroso, eso, eso prieto, uh, eso mayate, I can't fuck with you now. Like, there's something that it tingles my spine in the wrong way. Like, yo, you, you don't realize how you've been brainwashed. And I've, I've dealt with a lot of that in the career that I had. And it, it, it's been interesting to me because I have a dual, a dual background, right? Like I, I'm from New York, everybody knows me from Harlem. So that's where I grew up around, you know? So I just saw people as people. And it wasn't like I saw, oh my God, this is a ghetto. And I'm like, a ghetto? Let me take you to Peru. Can I show you a fucking ghetto? Like in Harlem, you got a you know, faucet. And when you turn it, water comes out. Like you flush the toilet and you don't need to pull a bucket down the toilet to make it flush. Like I had to, like my little cousins that grow up in a second generation that come here, they really uh, confused and associate ghetto with what the mainstream media says looking at our people. And, and that's another thing we have to confront and we have to have an honest conversation about. If you were a person, right, a white, whatever person in the middle of uh, America, and you had never really had an interaction with black or Latino or indigenous people ever in your life, and the only interaction you really had with them was through the media that we have and movies. How could you not grow up being a racist? How could you not grow up with those tendencies to look at how we're portrayed so, so one dimensionally, right? How it, ha it has to be one thing or another. There's no nuance with our character. It's just evil or good. If we follow what they do, it's evil. If we follow what they don't do, it's good, you know? Movies about uh, narcotics. You know, here's an, an, another thing that I, I, I told you, I'm from Peru and, you know, one thing that's underreported in the media is that the Peruvians move more cocaine than the Colombians. But in American lexicon, you don't hear that. You don't hear that. It's almost 30%, I'll be right now. I'm, I'm not going to find that. There's an old saying, you, you, all, all the scholars out there, that 67% of statistics are made up on the spot. So I'm not gonna sit here and give you uh, fake numbers, but it's definitely more. The funny thing is this, in the American lexicon, like I was saying, a uh, political discourse or movies or whatever it is, you hear the term Colombian drug lord and you don't hear the term Peruvian drug lord. And there's a very simple reason for that. It's because the Colombians had to go through Mexican cartels to get their stuff here. And the Peruvians had a direct deal for a long time with what people call the cartel of the United States. Now, the United States actually has various cartels, and our relationship to those cartels is, uh, has always been a subservient one. And we've been placed as the patsy, as the front runner of it. The American cartel is run by an American who's not a white guy, a, a Latino dude with a sombrero and a, a mustache. No. A man with connections to both sides of the aisle who has the ability to process plants. Things that I, I mean, I had to go to Afghanistan in 2009. I know people have looked me up and seen my history to build an orphanage. And I, I saw it myself, a soldiers guarding poppy fields. And I said, well, what? Why would American troops be guarding the heroin plants from other people? And you begin to realize that we only hold the country because of our relationship with some of the worst entities there, which is some of the relationships that we've had with our people, with our own government. You know, whether they're a right wing or a left wing government. And that's something that we have to come to terms with in terms of how we confront repressive and authoritarian societies, even if they fit the demographic and the narrative of something that we appreciate and love and say, well, this is an example and a bastion of struggle against Latin America. You know, one of the things that I was taught as a kid was, uh, you know, Simon Bolivar in his revolution were only successful because they were aided by Francois Toussaint. And the Haitians, they sent them cannons, they sent them uh, mortar, they sent them all this equipment to be able to, 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 to fight against the Spanish and that just wasn't reciprocated. These are things about our society that were, and they're kept out of it. You know, we, we, we also learn, and I, I know I'm, I'm repeating a lot of knowledge for people who already know this, but it's because we want the people who are gonna watch this, who are kids and who are coming up, who don't have this and don't know that it was the Spanish and the Portuguese that first invented racial classifications 
for us. The, the mestizo, right, the so-called mulado, which is a, a total racist term. And kids need to understand that. That's the combination of the horse and the mule. The horse meant to represent the European, the mule represent the African, the beast of birth. And when those two were coupled, uh, a, a mule is also born sterile. It, it, it can't have children. So it, it was an example. Nothing good comes from the mixture of these people. We have to create a tier to separate them. And that's the only way that they've really ever conducted themselves. You know, the, the people that came here in 1492, I remind people when we talk about immigration, and that's a big thing with our people. If Europeans have come here from the time Ellis Island was open, because they act like that happened in 1776. No, Ellis Island opened in like 1899. So if they came here for the past hundred years or so, yeah, you're an immigrant who had benefits and understandings that you didn't even understand you had. You know, you applied for whiteness, not just applied for citizenship. That's why you were able to go to have unions or join unions or live in a non red line district or join the police force or the, the fire department. But, you know, what I remind other people is that if you came before that as a European, you didn't come here because you were an immigrant. You came here as a land stealer. You came here because you thought this was a lawless place. They created a settler, settler colonial state and our children need to understand not just the knowledge of self of our people, but the knowledge of, of, of self of other people as well. Who are the people who came here and, and established America? A settler colonial state that came to an indigenous continent and said, we're gonna have something here. And what was their plan, right? We always hear about people's agendas. Oh, this new station has an agenda. These people have an agenda. The, 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 the immigration people have an agenda. Black Lives Matter has an agenda. What was the agenda of the people that came here? They thought that we were gonna to go to some corner of this continent and die. If not, they were gonna take the best parts of the land. They didn't want to give people reservations. You know, every fucking thing that they have is because it was tested on them first before Europeans had the chance to do it to anything else. That's what the great Russell Means taught me. You know, that's what I learned at Pine Ridge from the Lakota people, that, that, that that's, that's the, the God's honest truth. So when you look at what their intention was, and that's why I, I have had oh, so much solidarity with the African-American community, because they fucked that up for you too. Huh? They thought that, oh, we're gonna have this continent where it's just gonna be all white and it will turn, yeah, but, but you couldn't even hold true to your own promises. Oh, hey, Tech, you're on the mute right now. Can you hear me again? Yeah, we can hear you now, perfect. Yeah, so we're, we're just dealing with people that have never kept their word. And you know, the, the bottom line is that I've been out here just trying to do whatever I can do. I've had uh, some food runs to the Bronx, which is in desperation, and um, in Brooklyn uh, at the projects that are Albany houses. So we're extending the program now. We get various connects and various people are willing to use their privilege to get us into these places that have um, like uh, uh, wholesale goods, which by the way, like a person that always went to the bodega as a kid, I'm always gonna feel cheated for the rest of my life now that I've bought like four, 50 cans of Goya beans for like seven ninety nine. But we will be able to supply lots of communities. And when we say we're taking care of elders, that is uh, a very layered statement as well, because I remind people that in a lot of our communities, the elders are the ones taking care of the kids. Whether the kid's outside working, whether somebody's protesting, whether they're in the streets, whether they're working, because a lot of people are working through this. You know, our people were hit by the COVID harder because we had to power through it. And we thought, oh, we're going to power through it like a regular cold. And it wasn't that, you know. I was saying this for the first time, maybe about uh, a week ago, I, I gave an interview with um, the Revolt TV. And they asked me, they were like, well, how has this affected you? And I explained there were family members of mine that got sick. And then I told them that in January, like around the, the, the new year, I got really sick and I, I didn't know what the hell it was. I'm not gonna sit here, I, I didn't trust the, the, the hospital to go get tested. I didn't know what the hell they were gonna do. I, I had luxuries and advantages that other people didn't have, right? And that's where we get into the meat and potatoes of how this destroyed our community. I had the ability to call a doctor, right? I haven't had a nine to five, I make money off music and I've had, uh, my, I own my own publishing, I own my own masters, I own my own sync license. Anytime it's on YouTube or played, it's something that I started out because I went independent from day one. So 
when I had the ability to call a doctor to give me and send me medicine to my house, right? I had the ability to sit in my house and not go anywhere for five, six days. But when I say coughing, like my stomach felt clenched, like, you know, to the point where it hurt to breathe and, you know, cold sweats at night and just feeling disgusting. And I thought to myself, damn, Abuelita, I can't take this. A lot of our people that are out here working uh, nine to five or can't see in the morning, they can't see at night jobs as uh, doing some practical wage slave shit here in America. They can't power through this. And, and, and we see the end result. Although now we do see that the government uh, uh, has definitely, and this is what I said at the very beginning, takes us all the way back full circle, that the government has used the coronavirus, has used a lot of other things that have happened in the mainstream media to distract the people from the fact that not only is everything about this society exposed now, but also that the American dollar has lost value, right? And we as Latino people that are immigrants that have come here, especially I'm talking to the ones that come from South America, the ones from Mexico, less, I, I, I think people from the Caribbean have, have had that in their history as well. But specifically, I can say in the past few decades, when we talk about mass inflation and displacement of the people, uh, Peru, Colombia, Mexico, we, we, you, El Salvador, you can see exactly what inflation then does and how it creates factions within a society because now they're fighting over less resources. In other words, the last time black people got really mad, you know what I mean, or Latino people got really mad, we've destroyed a neighborhood. The last time white people got really mad at each other, they ripped this country in half. So is there a possibility for a civil war? Is, th is that where we are right now? A lot of people feel that. So let's, uh, let's also uh, understand some other things about indigenous Latino people. As immigrants or as other people that have come to this country, we have other advantages that we've never discussed. We can always say, oh, we, we land back where we came from and there's some family there. Some people don't have that luxury, right? That was just something that this government assumed when they mass deported people, you know? My cousin was one of those people that was deported. And he was born with a learning disability. So he was jumped by the cops and, you know, he, he, he's, he's mildly schizophrenic. So he was like, oh, you know, get off. He shoved the guy. They said that he assaulted a police officer. He didn't beat nobody up, but, you know, that was it. We tried as hard as we could. We went to the detention center. They were like, no, when you have a felony assault, he's got to go. So, you know, we, we back in contact with the whole family back in Peru to make sure people are safe. But, you know, that, that, that's one case where a person lands on their feet and we're dealing with lots of cases where people don't land on their feet. And what Americans don't understand about the countries that we come from is, is that it doesn't work, gangs don't work like they work here, right? They're like, oh, I want to join the gang, let me get jumped in. No, somebody knock on your door, like, listen, your son's in our gang now. This whole neighborhood is with us now, right? That political factions flip overnight and that the people that are always caught and that are the brunt of the damage are the women in our culture and especially the indigenous people in that, and the African American. And, and I was making it very clear, a lot of, a lot of Dominicans here in, in, in New York, and you know, my family back in Peru, they joke, they call me El Caribeño because I speak Spanish like a Dominican sometimes because I've just lived here for so long. But I had a conversation and, and after this, I'll, I'll just open it up for questions from anybody. And, criticisms, please shoot me. I take you bullets, right? I, I, I was talking to a Dominican friend of mine, he was talking to his father, and he was father. He was a guy who was living during the regime of Trujillo, he was a dictator, a dictatorship in, in, in the Dominican Republic under Trujillo. And I asked him, I said, during that time, could a police officer um, arrest somebody and it wasn't that person and there'd be no consequences? And they said, yeah. I said, yo, let me ask you something else. If you looked at a police officer the wrong way or a, a soldier in the Dominican Republic during through here, could they smack you in the face and have no consequences and be like, and that's just known that don't look at them, look at the ground. And he goes, absolutely, that's how it was. If there was a murder and the police or these soldiers were guilty of it, would they get punished the way other people would be punished? The man understood what I was getting to. He said, no, there would be no repercussions the way we have them now. I said, imagine that. You're getting killed, raped, tortured, all this shit, and there's no repercussions. What makes that different right now from what we're facing in real time, from what you're coming from then? 
And I think that's the only way that some of the elders can relate to it. You will remind them hey, with that mass inflation is coming, right? Joblessness, the, the scarceness of resources. And where do we go forward, you know? I, I, I hear all the time, you know, love doesn't trump hate, organizing trump hate. You know, we need to organize as much as we can within local communities, within uh, across the class system. One great failure we have to remember when we come into this country, uh, and I, I, I learned that as an immigrant growing up in Harlem, that a lot of the, the, the failures of the civil rights movement had to do with class. You know what they, people learned a lot at, at the uh, end of the civil rights movement? That rich black people wanted to live around poor black people about as much as rich white people wanted to live around poor white people. That rich Latino people really wanted to live around poor Latino people about as much as rich white people wanted to live around poor white people. That a lot of these divisions came from a lot of classes and that we have to accept something. That whether you're a business major, whether you're a creative person, whether you lean to the right or the left, just, just take this gem with you and we'll open them up for questions. Capitalists and communists both agree on one thing, that class is not determined by the, the amount of money that you racked up on this video game for adults. Uh, class is determined by who controls resources, right? Who controls the means of production. So a person who makes $30,000 a year is seen as a low or working class person. And a person who makes $300,000 a year is seen as a rich person or a middle class person or three million or whatever. But that person who makes 300,000, right now they're not working, right? They got a house that's worth 800,000 that they're in debt for. They got a fucking car that's still, they're worth negative $600,000 right now and they can't pay a goddamn thing. And this thing has reminded them and exposed to them that you are a wage slave. Right? That your kids didn't, could have gone to the best schools in the world because they're learning from a fucking Zoom the way you're learning right now. You could have offered Harvard, could have offered these classes we have right now to the fucking world, but they didn't. Why? Because they're hoarding knowledge. They're hoarding knowledge because they know it leads to the advancement of culture and they want to keep you stupid and unaware of what's going on. You know, I wish I had more good news, but this is the type of shit that I talk about in my music and this is who I am. And, I'm writing a, um, an album called The Middle Passage, and uh, I'm also writing a book. So I hope that someone want to read it and someone wants to listen to it. And I just appreciate the fact that I still have people that are out there supporting my music and showing me so much love. So I am paying it forward right now by delivering these resources to these communities where a lot of people, you know, they, when, when you're from uh, uh, an immigrant community, you don't get that assistance. There was no stimulus check for you. Those people need our help, you know what I mean? Especially the elders, because the elders take care of the seeds. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Immortal Technique. Um, just uh, feel free, like he said, if anyone wants to ask me any questions, I'm more than willing to sit here. You know? My food's done. You gotta cook, fellas. Fellas, listen, you ain't, you ain't gonna get nowhere in life. You don't know how to cook. I don't know how to chef up, I don't know how to make it I'm nice. My mom said that when I first time I told her, that, Mom, I really want to talk to this girl I like at school. She said, You gotta make something to eat for her, otherwise, that's the stereotype. In my house, my dad cooked all the time, so he was a chef. Anything you guys need to ask, I'm here. Thank you so much, Tech, for the, for the, for the talk. We really appreciate it. So, right now, we have the, a question from Catherine. Go ahead and ask Catherine. Primero de todo, hola Causida, um, yo soy de Perú, and I've listened to you since I've been little, and I've like resonated with your music. Nací en Huancayo, de la provincia, de la sierra, and literally everything you said, like I 100% agree with. And like when you when you're talking about hoarding knowledge, like right now, like my question is more about how do we redistribute these resources to la comunidad en Perú. Because right now, what we're going through, we're, I'm, I'm gonna be real with you, Latin America is gonna get the worst of Corona. Like right now, Brazil, Ecuador, Peru have become the epicenters of this entire like disease. And the reason is why, because the population, como dijiste, indígena, all the people that like are being forgotten, 
is because they don't have the names. They don't have papers. And like at the end of the day, who's stealing all the money that the government is supposedly giving out, right? So right now I was gonna ask you like more of a kind of helping question, like to see if like you would be interested. So I'm, I don't know if you've heard about the page being Peruvian. What is that? It's like an Instagram page that has like a lot of following both in like the US, like for like expatriados peruanos, like all over the world, as well as in the US. And it's recently been coming to my attention that like a lot of the resources that the government is giving out in Peru is not being given out properly because you're están robando los alcaldes. Of course, you know the people, of course, if you watch like Peruvian news, you get, you know where I'm coming from. So I was speaking to the creator and the owner of the page who gets a, like, he gets over a hundred thousand views on everything he does oh here and in Peru. And my problem is that the people are hoarding knowledge. People in Peruvian like government are hoarding knowledge. So I was going to make, um, kind of like a political video. I was talking to the owner of a page and he said he was a hundred percent to blast it out on like, cause he has like followers from all over the world because they're like, you said the communities is the basis. I don't trust the government to repartir nothing because the government is people. So right now I'm working Um, my aunt is working with Cadenas, um, Cadenas de Ayudas para Peru. And it's basically community based where people and stuff. But I think like with your platform, you could really like help like spread the message of like how we need to focus on from community. If the government's not gonna help us, peruanos a peruanos, we have to help us, right? So my message would be basically like, my question is like, would you be interested in like participating? If like, we don't have to record it together anything, like you could record a blurb separately. If you would be interested in like participating in the video that I'm currently working on. Yeah, I mean, I mean, send, send me the information so I could read it, look at it. And then I, I'm, I'm down with the idea. You know, I, I already like what I hear. I think it's a positive thing, you know, and it's not something that requires a lot of work. It's literally just being able to understand where I can help promote um, like a good cause or let people know that this is going on or that, you know, there's something that they should pay attention to that they haven't. You know, I think in activism, one thing that a lot of people forget is that you're not really supposed to show up somewhere and just tell them what to do. You show up and you're like, you know, what do you need? You know, when I went to Standing Rock, I'm like, hey, you guys need to act like this and then, you know you know oh form your formation like that no i'm like Yo, what do y'all need me to do we carry water here do that you know th th there's a point where i definitely had to be like hey listen please don't try to take advantage of me but this is not that there's the you know what i mean there's people and and that's what's fucked up in the movement is when people g people for money and that's why i can always appre appreciate when people just want something honest and genuine because i think that taints everything and i you know listen I, I was I was I was a person who was uh, 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 like one of the first people on board with Undocu Media, and look at that fucking that dumpster fire, fucking dumpster fire that it ended in because nobody was there to g check shit, and people were like, "Where's the money going?" And you know, but whenever people have like a real like a good cause, like like you're saying, and they just need my help for something. Look, I'm more than happy to do whatever I can do. You know what I mean? That's how we first started doing this. And that's how I first started teaching in prison. Someone called me from East Lake Juvenile Hall out there, like in LA, and they were like, yo, I need you to talk to these to these little homies, man. They, they look up to you. And they, they were like, you know, they want, want you to come in there and you know, talk about the things we've been through. And so, yeah, yeah, let's work, uh, get the information to teach her and then, I will contact you. I'm, I'm going to get your email from them, but thank you very much. Yeah. And thank you for coming. Like, I really like, you have no idea. I've been listening to you for like over 10 years. Like, come on. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Have a good day. Right. So we have a next question from Eric. Sure. Heck, man. Oh, my goodness. I'm beyond ecstatic. Like, he's a streamer. I'm to you right now. Um, so for starters, I'm one of the co-directors of an undergraduate program here at Davis that connects uh, undergrads to incarcerated youth at the local county juvenile detention facility. And just whenever your music comes up, you just see the kids in the center, their eyes just light up completely like, Tech, what? You know, what you know about Tech? And it's just, it's crazy. One song that always comes to mind is The Fourth Branch. Like that song in itself, just I know that song like the back of my hand from how many times I, that song, I feel like influenced me in my life. 
pursue law here at undergrad. And it's, it's just crazy because I want to know what your thought process was when writing this song, because honestly, I think it's brilliant and it's relevant even today. Well, I mean, I think at the time, um, one interesting thing about, about us so-called Latino people, I come from like a indigenous Latino background. So for me, I've been one of these individuals that's racially ambiguous. Like I've met people that they're like, oh, what are you? So um, once upon a time at the time uh, when I wrote Revolutionary Volume 2, um, I was dating a girl from Afghanistan and I met her because um, there was some conference about 9-11 and everybody was screaming and talking about all oh, these people are terrorists and I, I came out the woodwork like a maniac and I was like, well, wait a minute, you know, your man Bin Laden was the one who the CIA uh, had on the payroll. Like, y'all y'all talk about that. I was like, how, how come you set up these anti-communist regimes in Latin America that are built off torture? So one day she called me on the phone and she's like, oh my God, the bombardment has started. And I, 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 I turned the TV on. So I, li I live in New York. I went through 9-11. I had to go through checkpoints to pick up my sister from school. We volunteered to go down and help clean up, you know, just all kind of crazy shit. But in this case, when the war in Iraq started, literally it was like a blanket of media, right? Everything became, oh, Navy SEALs rock and these people are amazing and our military is unquestionable. And, you know, as people who... I, I, listen, most of the family that I have is, is pretty liberal people. And I, I remind them, you know, during this time, they had a, a, a Bush uh, doctrine to knock over countries. And they continued that during the Obama era, knocking over countries. So I felt like at that point, the 9-11 effect had pushed all politics to the right. So the people that were in the center were now seen as whatever the extreme of it. So the, the, the far left, excuse me, the far right people who never had a platform were now seen as the right, right? The right-wing people were now seen as the middle. And in the middle, the, the center-right party, which is the Democratic Party, right? There's a center-right party that is now, they're running a Republican, basically, against a far-right Republican in, in, in Trump, who's an idiot. And they're running a, a, like a moderate Republican, who is Joe Biden and his policies for years, against that. But I think that's what we, we like, when I saw that, and I saw the, the way that they would be on MSNBC during the Obama administration, talking about the logic of a war in Syria. And I'd be like, well, oh my God. And then you look, and I look at the Republican era when it's like, well, these, the Bush administration tactics are here doing this. And, you know, they're, they're really very uncomfortable truths that we have to face about how these political parties have used us at, at different times. And they've done that through the, the media, which then helps them branch out to different places and, you know, give their version of events. Because before, it was just like a newspaper platform, right? Before it was just, they, they, it, wasn't, it wasn't like someone just gave you information and then told you what to think about. Because most of the stuff that we see on TV today, brother, that's not, that's not news, it's an opinion show, right? So it's a right-wing cat giving you his opinion about what the news is, you know? And then saying, oh, but this is my, my slant on what's actually going on. So it's not really what's going on. So the mainstream media who's portrayed as totally left and which some of them are, but they're, they're just, they, they're stuck to the point of, I got to just tell the story and I can't put my opinion in and I got to fight a guy at the same time going on who's telling me that I'm a piece of shit and everything's so set up and it's all messed up. And you know, only Democrats molest children in the pizza parlor. And when those things are actually going on within all our society and that if you want to talk about a uh, 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 sexual misconduct that we can look at, uh, uh, all of Latino history to see how the Catholic Church has done this in our countries for, for hundreds of years before the America even existed. So I think that's just something that, 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 that really struck me. I wanted to, to expose that the media is in itself an entity, a part of the government, you know, no longer independent journalism. That's why I revel in, you know, speaking to whenever I can find independent media or you know, whenever I can find a class to talk to or young people to, to express, you know, my truth to take that. And the biggest lesson I have is just don't make the same mistakes I've made. Hey, thank you so much for the insight on that. Oh, my goodness. Like, I'm, like, smiling internally. Like, obviously, this can, Zoom doesn't serve justice right now. But, like, holy crap, thank you. And it's just, like, I know you wrote the song, but it's just the last five lines of the fourth branch 
they're engraved in my mind. And even just reading over it right now, I'm just like, holy shit. Like, like just reading it, I just see just how much, like, everything you're saying now makes sense. And... Yeah. But I mean, you gotta you understand that was also not 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 to cut you off, but that was also a response to something else that I saw, and that was like the blind patriotism from hip hop. Like I felt like these people were just like, when did we become so like pro whatever? Like, are you crazy? Do, do you know what what's what's happened now? All of a sudden, we give cops a pass for this. They have they have surveillance laws. This is all about terrorism. And then when you look it up, who who were they going after with the majority of the anti-terrorism money? It was being diverted to like the, the the DEA funds going after low level drug dealers. That whole lie about oh we've got to get the, the 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 little fish so we can get the big fish. No, you was getting the big fish and getting him to wrap the long little fish so you could fill the jail cells and make money that way. And we were the casualty of that war, of their media war on our people, portraying us like we're the worst shit in the world. Like 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 when like when black and Latino people had. A, 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 a drug, uh, like a drug epidemic in the 70s, 80s, 90s, right? That, that, that becomes a, 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 a justice issue, right? That, that becomes something that has to be dealt with punitively. But then when they have a, a, an opioid epidemic, which is what they call their heroin binge, right? Then that's dealt with like a medical crisis. It's dealt with differently. And that can only be done through the media portraying us as if we're subhuman, as if we're not what what built this country, you know. The the there's a Congress in 1988, I remind people, where they actually talk and they they, they say in this Congress, um, they they have this this bill where they thank I think it's uh, resolution three three zero, and they talk about how the Iroquois Confederacy was a big inspiration for the model of the 13 colonies and contributed directly to the Constitution. So these people didn't come here with brand new ideas. A Republican, a Republic is as old as Jesus. You know what I mean? Like we, we come on now. And that's, that's a 2000 year old concept. And even back then, whoever controlled the minds of the people through swaying them through propaganda, controlled the mob. And now as we've seen, America is the mob. Any big country is the mob. You know what I mean? You have a mob of people. And, you know, there's no such thing as a government. It's just people who rule over other people. There we are. <laughs> Our next question is from Mark. Yeah, I just unmute myself. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to thank you because before I ask a question, I just want to thank you because I've been a hip hop artist since I was like 12 and I've been listening to you since about then as well. And just the other day, I was listening to your song from Revolutionary Volume 2 called You Never Know. And that's one of my favorite songs. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and yeah, it basically, I'm just reminded of a conversation I had with my uncle when I was like 13 or 14. And I was like, yeah, I'm probably going to write rhymes forever because my two biggest inspirations are Tupac and Immortal Technique and <laughs> still true. So yeah, um, but I my question is really simple. I wanted to ask sort of what you, what you think, and this doesn't just apply to America, but I'm sure if you can figure it out here, you can figure it out anywhere, but I wanted to ask you basically what you think a framework is for for us to atone for our sins essentially because i've been thinking about it a lot like for a while i was like oh you know music connecting with the people etc can really change stuff and i'm like no it's these huge jerks that write law <laughs> Right. So, yeah, so I was just asking sort of how how you think about that or how you think we can sort of crawl out of this cave, so to speak, that's been brewing for 300 years. I think that, look, for, for, for a lot of time, there's been severe misinformation taught to people. And I think that a lot of it is uh, misinformation with purpose. So like, for example, the first time I ever learned what a redneck was. I learned that it had very little to do with a person's race and it had more to do right. with their economic status, right? In right. the same way for the kids that are watching, you know, the guy takes off his shirt at the end of the day, his back is white, 
His neck is red. It symbolizes mm -hmm. a working class person. That's mm -hmm. another big part of what we have to face, that this society is a capitalist society and a failed one that's failed several times. Yeah. And that it uses racism to keep that classist system in place. In right. other words, you know, there's, a, there's an old guy, and I, I've, I, I and other people have said this for years, there's an old man who laid it out historically. I think he went viral the other day and he was sitting in his car and he said, he was talking about the treaty that Torres which is a part of what we deal with in Latin American society, which is why we have Brazil and then the rest of all of Latin America is, uh, is Spanish speaking. And when you look at these things, these are old systems that were set up that people are still paying for. Like in other words, in other societies in Haiti, um, they created an entire racial class of people called the so-called mulatto people, light-skinned black people, that would then be the, the buffer zone between that. And how does that affect Latin America, people ask. That, that's not a French, that's a French speaking country for them. I say, okay, well, what about the story of Panama? And people say, oh, wow, what, what does Panama mean? I said, okay, once upon a time, Colombia was actually a much bigger country than it is now. Mm -hmm. And the United States went there and said, hey, can we create a Colombian canal? canal? And the, the Colombians said, no, no. So they fomented a rebellion and said to the more Afro-Latino population in the north of, of, uh, of, of Colombia, do you really want to be with these racist, white, criollo people that have done all these terrible things? Why don't you have a country of your own? But the price of your country is to have this canal here and we're gonna own it for 99 years and we'll have an automatic lease renewal for another 99 years. Um, I think what we're confronted with is the fact that a lot of these, these relationships were set up so long ago that just now, for example, the, the, the Bank of France has agreed that like former colonial African states don't have to give money to the Bank of France. I think that if you want to start to look at it from the point that you're bringing up, yeah. which is not just scholastically, but you know economically, like how, how can you do it in real time? I think that a total overhaul of looking at where those resources are actually sent to, who's, who's the people holding them? Who's the one, like we can go out here work all day long, right? But then what do we do with the money? Who's, who's actually keep, keeping it for us, you know? And I think that when we remove you know, like I've always been a big thing, a big person that wants to remove uh, money out of politics because that's yeah. always been just right. a catch twenty two. So it's like it's like a hook. It's a hook by your leg. What, what, why? Why wouldn't the guy? Like when I explain to people, and especially when when it's working class Latino people, we're organizing that we that that are coming from the from a hood perspective that will that will break it down better than a college professor that will say, oh, so the government gives these big stores here billions of dollars and they right. create 10 minimum wage jobs which we can't even apply for because we don't have paper yeah. right but yeah. yeah this is this is what they've set up so you're dealing with a lot of old systems so you so know, it's that, basically that's economics well, well, well a lot that's that's true but i think understanding the, the history right. of where racism actually comes from you right. know and the idea of the, the reconquista which was mm -hmm. the last um, which was like a last Spanish crusade, which is very important in, in designating kind of that racial tier and caste system. And right. also that we, we're, we're ingrained to the idea of a God, right? A, a all powerful, most, most people who are Latino people believe in a God. The problem is that we've always got that interpretation through a European version of Christ. That's not to say- And patriarchal. That I would tell right. people, right. Look, when people ask me about religion, I'm not saying, yeah. hey, you should stop believing in Jesus tomorrow. Right. But just consider this fact. That's how they got you. That's how badly they mm -hmm. colonized you. Right. That you think all of the things that your people believed in a thousand years ago are fake. And you think that the only truth that they got you in now. Now, whether you're a devout Christian or you're right. a Muslim or you, you still have some spiritual ancestry, you have to admit that that's one fucking hell of a power and a grip to have over someone's mind, that you think that your people are a lie and that someone other, other individual could give you the truth. And that's just God's will, right? That, 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 that seems to explain everything. So if the worst things happen in the world, we can explain them away through that. And to me, I say, well, that's because the story's not yet finished. That's the rebuttal to it. No, this isn't God's will. You're living in the present term now. We're talking about what ends up happening 100 years from now, where we end up as a people. 
And that's where I think, you know, the, the, the meat and potatoes of the answer to your question is, like the Palestinians say, our existence yeah. is, our, is our resistance. You know what I mean? Right. You have to continue existing to keep resisting. Right. It. And it's sort of a responsibility. It's a responsibility, right? You can't just run away from the responsibility to protect people and to resist. Yeah, thank you so much for your question. Of course, we're going to go to the next one. The next question is from uh, Cynthia. Hello, Cynthia. Cynthia, can you, uh, are you there? Sorry. Uh, hi, Ted. Thank you so much for um, spending time out of your day. I'm like, you know what? I first heard of you when I was like in eighth grade, which was about like eight years ago. And uh, <laughs> that's Dance with the Devil was my favorite song. Well, it's my favorite song from yours. Um, and I just can feel like the passion and you talking today confirms that passion that you have. Um, one of my questions was that through all this, I mean, what we're going through today is really heavy stuff. And you may say or can say that it's nothing new, right? And that it's now being captured and people are finally being more united. So my question is that among all this like craziness, how do you keep, what are some ways that you keep yourself safe or like so? or how they call it nowadays, self-care. Um, take care of yourself, to, you know, to, to be able to do your social, like, just, and be able to, like, give people resources and basically stay safe through all these times. Well, if I could be totally honest with you, um, I have a little bit of an advantage that other people don't have, and it's not, a, it's not from a positive one, right? Like, when I was a kid, um, I was about 19 years old. I went to prison, right? And it was a terrible experience. Like when I say that I, I came out of there a man because nobody ever stomped me out or raped me. Yeah, I could say that, but at the same time, these people did take a piece of my humanity away when they used to strip search me or, or, or be able to, 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 to talk to me with all kind of racist language or put me anywhere. But um, I was sent to a place called um, the Hole. Uh, they would call it RHU, the Restrictive Housing Unit. Um, and I stayed there for about two months. And the OG that was there was a Native American cat named Judge. And he gave me a piece of paper. And he goes, you don't have nothing in there, so take this. And I said, what? He goes, this is all you need. I said, really? He goes, this is your life preserver. He goes, mad people go crazy in there. And he, so he told me something real. He goes, there's some hardened criminal. In there. People who have murdered people, people who have no problem doing things that you and me would say, that's terrible. But they can't take the box, ma. That box terrifies them. And it's horrible to be alone because the scariest person they gotta be with is themselves. That way when people start talking and those voices aren't them speaking, they know that something else is with them. They're, they're very troubled people a lot. So one thing that I always remember is when I was in there, I was able to channel that fear, that, that, that ability to oh, like you feel like you're underwater. And it was almost like I was able to breathe underwater there because I was able to write down my experiences, write down my ideas, write down everything. So I wrote down stories. I wrote down the beginning of some of the songs from Revolutionary Volume 1 um, and even some of the song concepts from like two or three of them from Volume 2. So for me, I think that when, when I look at my creativity in writing, um, and the way that we've used it in every prison workshop that I've had, um, I think that is something that helped me. But for me, it's like I, I could be alone standing on my head. Like, I don't need people around me. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the last person. I always tell a shorty, I'm the last person that's ever going to stalk you. I was socially distant. Listen, I was socially distant. I was a god before the Greeks and Osiris. <laughs> I was socially distant before the virus. All right. I was, I'm not like a like a social butterfly, but I, I, I totally understand like the, the, the necessity to, 
to have human contact. You know, we're, we are a human contact people. So we need to have like a hello. And when you alone, like I, when I worked in the New York prison system with um, Carmen Perez and one of the things that, I, that happened the first day I was there was that they banned uh, solitary confinement for children. That year, it was, it was like the year before, it was like 2014, 15. So imagine that, New York and, and North Carolina were the last two states to ban that. So they agreed that that's torture. So you gotta accept that isolation and isolating yourself in some way, shape or form is torturing yourself. Obviously, please, I'm not categorizing it with anything horrible because I don't want to denigrate what other people's experiences have been through. No, you, it, it's not like prison, believe me. Like, you got a fucking phone you could use. You could call somebody over to wild out with, you know what I mean? You could, all y'all got to do is take a test together. Like, you know what I mean? You got to, you, 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 you could call your family. You could watch television. You can cook anything you want to eat. You don't have to eat Jack Mac patties and shit like that. Like, you, you can have anything you want in, that's in terms of your house. You can learn a new skill. You know, I, I'm nice at cooking now because I, you know, grew up with a Peruvian mom, but also that I went to all the YouTube channels like maybe like two months ago. And there's no excuse now. I tell brothers, there's no excuse for not knowing how to cook anything that you have out there. You can have. So it's like, man, you, you got you got to use the time to better yourself. Work on some shit that you that you don't have. And I always remind you, a true teacher and a true master always wants the student to be greater than themselves. And what I mean by that is don't you have to be greater at whatever I do that's great. When you hear what I say, don't have to be greater than rapping to me. No, take what I do. I'll take the example and the failures that I've had and use them to make yourself better at what it is you do and to make yourself the best at that. You know, use that time because that's what I did in prison. Use my example, even though it's a harsher one. So like I said, being able to survive that gives me a little bit of a psychological edge. But it, it, it'll work for you if you put your heart to it because you use that time to better yourself. And you say, oh, you know what? I'm, I'm taking this so I can learn this skill or I can take this time to, to benefit myself. Because at the end of the day, you know, nobody's coming to save me. I'm the only person out here, you know? Thank you so much. All up. Our next question is from Iris. Hello, Iris. Hi, thank you for being here. Yeah, so I appreciate that you brought up um, like a conversation that you had with one of your elders about conditions in the Dominican Republic and just their upbringing and how things were under different dictatorships. You know, whether that be in the Dominican Republic or Chile or um, Guatemala, there, there has been this perpetual discrimination that our elders have faced from law enforcement and their own government. Um, so oftentimes it's really difficult to to have a conversation today about what's going on with them because they they remain indifferent, you know, they've been through it. They, they're like, there's never going to be any change. Um, so how do you think we can begin an informative conversation with our elders about um, how it's different, how it should be different in this country and perhaps because I, I usually try to start there with them that, you know, they obviously came from that country to this one because they thought it would be different here um, for some reason. And America shouldn't keep priding itself saying that it's, it is a different country of freedom and transparency. Um, it's it, so, how, I don't know, how, how can we kind of get that conversation going with them? <laughs> so my mom came here with my father um, and my father was like drafted out of the Peruvian military to go to Haverford College. Well, my mom came here later with me. And when she came to the United States, she was 20, 28, 29 years old. And she didn't speak any English at all. It would be as if you and me packed up and moved to China somewhere. And we're like, yo, we got to start over here. And we don't know nothing about it. I think that's the experience that they've had. So that in itself is traumatizing for a lot of the elders. So if you explain to them and say, hey, you know what? I might end up having to do what you did. And they'll say, what do you mean? Don't, you, you don't understand. Look at me. You got to look at them like that and just talk softly. Say, 
I might end up having to do what you did. I might end up having to get the fuck out of here. And I, I, I might have to take you with me because I don't think you're going to be safe here. I don't know what's going to happen. If they say to yourself, oh, Ben, things are going to be stable. You thought that before you came here too, didn't you? Ask them about the people they left behind back there that thought things were going to be fun. I think it's a hard conversation, you're right, because a lot of the elders aren't just, you know, stuck in their ways. They're also people that are suffering from large amounts of trauma. You know, re remember, for any elderly Latino couple, you know, uh, marital rape wasn't a crime until the 80s. Like, we talk about the, the, the subservient role that women are supposed to play in the society. You know, for, for whatever reason, because I guess my mom was in the Peruvian military, my father, she had a very different attitude. So she was very, like, confrontational. She didn't like that kind of racist shit. She thought that was a, a debilitation. So a member of my family came over one day, and he was like, he's an elderly person. And he said, you know, Cecilia, why do you let him play with these niggers in Harlem? And my mom lost it. She said, you know, my father's black. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? You racist idiot, what's wrong? what's wrong with you? There's sometimes where you just can't show quarter, you can't be nice about things. She was just like, I'm sorry. Like, like, like what, what are you thinking? And I clearly remember in my head, he looked at my dad, right? And was like, you know, Victor. And my mom put her hand here and was like, he can't help you. <laughs> like, no, you gotta stand on what you said. Don't, and she, she just confronted him, but, I think, look, my mom and my dad come from a generation where they went to, like, uh, 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 like to, to part of their schooling was, like, to, to respect elders. So they would just explain to him, like, do you know what a disadvantage you're giving him? Like, when he grows up racist, do you know, do you know what kind of disadvantage you give him in a society, right? Do you know, you know how twisted you make him see people? And I think... When, when they realize how much harm they're doing in a certain situation, that, that's, that's very telling, you know? So I, I think that you have to gauge it. Sometimes you got to push hard and sometimes you got to be, you know, understanding with the fact that they may never change their perspective, right? My grandma is never going to stop believing in the Catholic church, no matter what happens. And that's because she raised 10 children in Peru, right? And, you know, did it by believing that this white guy with blonde hair and blue eyes that was sitting on a cloud was looking out for her. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a person that denigrates other people's faith. So if I say to myself, well, somebody was looking out for her because she's an old woman in Peru who made it out the ghetto with 10 children. And my father went to Columbia University on a full ride. And, you know, he married a woman that was way out of his league, like most men do. So, you know what I mean? It's like, I, I, we could look at it like statistically we're good or like spiritually we're blessed. So depending on the elder you're dealing with, that's what you got to tell them. Either statistically we're lucky or spiritually we're blessed. But that's because we make decisions about pivoting in society. As immigrants, we came here. Mommy, Bobby, we might have to leave. What do we do? Thank you so much. Yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> no problem. Our next question is from uh, Brandon. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for coming. I, you know, I appreciate your knowledge, you know, um, that you bring to, to the chat. Um, I have a one question. Um, how do we explain to non-minorities non on the history of of the police here in the United States, because from what I know, uh, the police the police began as a militia that hunt, that hunt down and capture slaves. And when I look at this history, I, I can think of uh, the military dictatorship that arrested anyone who was left wing during the Cold War. And like this could be applied in countries like Chile, like where my friend she is, she's from Chile, um, Brazil other countries that have been affected by the Cold War because of communism. How do you explain to um, to the non-minorities on the history of police? Because people like to say that uh, all, all, all 
not all poli not all police officers are bad, but like when we look at the history, it it tells you a different story. How do you explain to them? Well, look, I would say that without accountability, there's absolutely no justice, no matter who's in charge, right? Other thing is this. I lived in New York during the 80s and 90s, fam, and the cops were mostly white cops, Italians, Irish, and they were super racist and violent towards us. And now the police, there's mad black and Latino people on the NYPD, and they're just as violent and just as racist. You know what I mean? That seems to get through to, 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 to non-minorities a lot, and to non-people of color. I don't like even calling us minorities. But to people who are not people of color, they begin to say, oh my God, okay. And then you say, oh, you, you want to look up white examples of people that have been murdered by police? Here's a, a, a very powerful one. There was a man named Daniel Shavers. There's was a white guy, and he's in a hallway um, on his knees. It's on YouTube. You could, y'all could, I mean, I don't recommend people look at, like, I, I'm, I'm not trying to recommend, like, murder porn, but what I'm saying is that he, he was in a hallway, and they machine gunned him down with like, I'm not, not with no AR-15 neither, with a fucking machine gun. And they killed him. So they have to understand something. Whether, whether we can say statistically, yes, black and Latino people die more often than white people. But you have to then flip the card back to white people. Well, when they finally do kill a white person, do they go to jail for it? <laughs> Look at that one. The statistics on that one are embarrassing for their argument. Because then it's like, no, they'll absolve themselves from a crime in a heartbeat. I think if you want to give them a reading material to look at and wanted to say, for example, okay, how could I then learn about a specific case um, besides like a Daniel Shavers uh, where there was just a, a straight up murder? How could I look at a case that developed over time so I can look at the legal background? And there's um, an article in Politico, I think it was like maybe five years ago by a, a white guy, a colonel. And um, he, he, the article was called What I Did When the Police Murdered My Son. And this guy's son had, uh, I believe, some type of mild autism. I mean, it was Asperger's. But he was, he was somewhere and I, 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 he had some interaction with the police and they shot him in the head. Um, and they actually came out in the investigation that they shot him twice in the head. The first time that they shot him in the head, brother, the bullet misfired and then they cocked the gun and shot him in the head again. Um, and it took them less than two hours to absolve themselves of his murder. And this guy uh, was talking to the community and he said, well, you know, something hit me at that point. He said, when I met other people in the community who I hadn't been connected to, whose children had also been murdered by police. And I met them in like this support group. And, you know, he's like, yo, I'm a well-to-do white guy. Not just that, I was a colonel in the U.S. Army. Like, I fought for America. I fought for this country. And I did everything, quote, unquote, right. And they still killed my son. And they're walking around like they don't have a care in the world. And he met a, a, an old black man uh, who said, well, imagine what they're doing to you. Imagine what they're doing to us. So I, I would recommend that article, what the police did when they, what I did when the police killed my son. It's written by a white man, so I think it's it's right up there, alley. But thank you for your question. We have time for uh, two more questions. So um, the next uh, person's up is uh, Brittany. Hello, Brittany. Brittany, you're Hello. muted. Brittany, unmute, unmute yourself, please. I did a whole speech about how thankful I am. My goodness. Okay, well, real quick, thank you so much. I'm super honored for you to be here. Thank you so much. Um, so I know your time is limited. Um, I don't want to take too much. So a quick question. I also run a separate organization where we do tutoring for incarcerated individuals, um, whether it's adolescents or you know adults. So we are gathering resources um, in preparation of when COVID-19 lifts. So real quick, do you have any um, reads that you suggest um, if they are interested in reading and empowering themselves? What, what are some 
um, books, authors that you highly recommend, you know, in order to share the knowledge. And as you said in the beginning, you know, um, there are people who don't want certain communities having different types of knowledge. So we would like to have any suggestions that you may have and how we can give it to them. Thank you. Um, well, I was gonna say for me, um, first of all, um, I would love to help out in any way, shape or form with whatever you guys are doing. Um, look, one of the most difficult things about me being in prison was me learning to not care about other people, right? That's something that people have to be taught because human beings naturally care about one another. We see someone else suffering and we don't want to see them suffer. When I was locked up, I seen a kid get jumped by five other people. And the OG is like, well, you can't go in the cell and save them. I'm like, well, they're really fucking them up. And they're like, well, that ain't got nothing to do with you. And as much as all the other stuff people say, oh, that's so hard. I say, no, no, no. It's hard not to care when you're a person that cares. So we have to understand that we're dealing with people that have been purposefully desensitized, right? And as an activist and as a person in the community, we can't expect laurels ever, right? Now picture this scenario. You're asleep in your house. It's three o'clock in the morning and all of a sudden some stranger is in your room shaking your arm saying, hey, wake up, you gotta get out of here. And you're just like, whoa, wait a minute. You're, who the fuck are you, dude? You're in my room, you're touching me? Who, what? And, and they say, wait a minute, hold on, look up. And when you look up, the roof is on fire and your house is burning and they're like get the fuck out of here right we're that person we're always going to be that person that 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 says hey wake up you got to get out of here and naturally human beings that are sleeping do not want to wake up a right and don't want to accept that the place that they that they call home is burning right they don't want to accept that the, the 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 political system is rotten and that may be rotten beyond repair but I think one of the things we learn as activists is that when we um, crowdfund, right, and when we make sure that we have actual resistance uh, through resources, that that can be done through several ways. Now, um, you know, in, in, in Colombia, uh, I asked one of the FARC members when I was in the jungle, I asked dude, I was like, you know, did they, did they really sell cocaine to fund a revolution? I was like, yo, be honest with me. And dude was really honest. He was like, you know, yeah, people were selling cocaine to fund the revolution. But you know why? And I said, why? He goes, because the CIA was selling cocaine to fund their paramilitary death squads. He goes, you can't fight, you can't win a revolution with book sales and, and bake sales, with book shows and bake sales. It's just like, you need actual resources. I think if we're talking about uh, being able to, to to gain ownership of that, then we have to talk about what industries we can control, how many people we can organize. We thought we could do that through unions. Now, unfortunately, those organizations became infiltrated. You know, we can look at everything that we've had. We can say, oh man, it's the religion, it's everything else. It's, you know, oh, it's just sexism, a patriarchal society, or it's the economic system, you know, fake capitalism, neoliberalism versus actual socialist democracy. And, or we'll say, oh, you know, it's, it's a, a belief in God or theocracy or, or we changed our religion or the culture. But I think what we've always had is this, that we are trying to fight the system with just one thing. And it has this tentacle to fight us with these many different things, these many different aspects of colonization. So I think as, as organizers, what's really good is to find people that represent a different aspect of that fight, right? And that helps you build solidarity across class lines, across racial lines, right? Who's really good with computers? We need you in here to hack it. Look, today we had the K-pop people, right? I don't know if anybody saw that. The K-pop stands, those individuals that got the, 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 the little AV in their thing is always like a, an anime character. Yeah, they, they decided to flood Dallas PD with like pictures of, of, um, of K-pop stars as like their identifying mark. So yeah, find anybody who you can work with out there who's good at something, build a solidarity across lines with them, help them understand your cause and your struggle. You know, when I first learned, learned, learned about Palestine, learned about Iraq, learning about these places in the Middle East, 
some Latino people who I, I made music with, they'd be like, well, what do you, why you talk about Arab stuff? What does that have to do with Latino people? And I said, pero yo quiero saber quién conquistó a los conquistadores. These people were Visigoths for fucking 400, 500 years. They weren't Spaniards yet. When the Moors came and lived there for 700 fucking years, three times as long, everyone says the Moors, oh, the Moors, for three times as long as America has existed as a country, right? And they were in France and all over Italy too. It's like, I want to understand that. I want to know their struggle. And I feel like if we build solidarity that way, we learn about someone else's struggle. You know, if I, I'm, I'm going to give you one example and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end your question. Um, I'm, I'm a, I get these gifts from people. So I was in Ireland and I went to Northern Ireland and I met um, the, the family of Bobby Seal. And, and they gave me a flag with the, with the people who were the, the children of the volunteers, right? That's not the regular Irish flag. It's like their, their symbol and their, their word was, their word of rebellion was Chucky or Allah, right? And that means our day will come. So I feel like, you know, if we learn about other people's struggles, whether they come from Eastern Europe or, you know, Africa, Latin America, you know, we, we enable ourselves to learn so many more tactics that have been used against people. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Our, our last question is from uh, Benjamin. Just say, unmute oh, yourself, please. Hi, I did not expect uh, to have a conversation with you, uh, Mortal Technique. Um, yeah, my question I've been studying for a long time. I was a freshman at UC Davis when Occupy got started and going all the way to like graduating in 2015. Now I'm in a unionized job. I've been reading Marx. And I read about racial segregation in the Sacramento area. So I've been trying to figure out, um, I guess, yeah, to simplify my question, it was just, um, do we still need a revolutionary party? I feel like, Ooh. and, or is it better to try? Because for me personally, it's like one of like recovering uh, the heritage of like Chicano uh, leftists uh, from the 60s. I had like read more about that. I had to do that research because I was just focused on penetrating and figuring out um, how our public institutions work and how, they, and how to like sort of penetrate the, the stranglehold that white, pro white professional culture has on like whatever environments uh, we're in whether it's the legislature and how neoliberal it gets and everywhere else but yeah like for me I've kind of wondered if I if going through those spaces if it would be better to uh, instead focus on what's going on in our communities and muting that in terms of being engaged with politics and being vocal and just focusing on just building up institutions to try and that these missing voids that have been left neglected uh, through public divestment. You see all the areas that like got hit by subprime mortgages were the same redlined areas. They were places where people fled to from refugees with urban renewal. And so um, I'm kind of stuck with this question about um, being vocal to take the state or rather filling in the voids that have been left behind by the state. And that's, I feel like, a question that is kind of facing a lot of people who would either sure. be thinking about law and so on and other professions. Well, first of all, I think that's, that's a very, very, uh, that's a very omnipresent subject right now because you have people whose entire faith in an activist movement is built around the concept of electoralism, right? An election where we participate in a system that's been set up. And, you know, when I was a kid, my sister and me had these comic books called Calvin and Hobbes, right? It was about a little kid who had an imaginary pet, like a, a tiger. And when they played a game, the tiger would change the rules of the game as soon as they were playing a game. Right, so he's like, oh, I, I'm at home base. And he's like, well, it's not home base. That's now third base. Home base is over there and the rules for this have changed. And I think what we have to understand is everything that we've gotten as a people, the fact that we're even fucking alive, that you and, you and my ancestors even survived 
is because we didn't participate in whatever they set up. Now, I get that. When people say, well, what do you mean, not voting? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying don't just use that as the only means. That's, that's where the trap is. There has to be, like, for example, listen, I know a lot of people who, when Obama was elected, they really thought they had themselves the most progressive person in the world. They thought, they really imagined that that was going to be the direction that that administration was going to go in when it didn't happen that way, when they deported more people than Bush, when it turned out to be a fallacy, you know, that, that then you had a different pivot for society. Then people were like, oh, we're going to do Occupy. You know, we're, that's not a vote at all. But that caught a lot of people's attention. That was in the news way longer than, you know, the election. And, and I think that when we look at some of these, these powerful movements, sure, they can, they can have a success, but unless they capture a resource, unless they capture an industry, unless they make themselves something that needs to be consistently talked about, you know, I, I think that, for example, political parties are, um, are, are, are an interesting means to an end, but at the end of the day, what they do is they work within an internal system of government to try try and shift resources. Again, you just want the resources that the government has from tax money so you can get that money back that you gave them so they can do this. You're no different than the person who's buying into the idea that Target's really helping the community by creating these $7 an hour jobs or 10 of them. But isn't that what we're doing with freedom and resources when we give into electoralism? We say, well, we're electing this. We want to push behind this political party so that that political party will be in control of and therefore we can have access to a budget that we gave tax money to that then we can get and then we can put towards resources that we can give to our people to make our lives better. That's a lot of steps. We could just take the resources and make our lives better. So um, I, I think a lot of people are re-examining how that works. But I'm not against electoralism. Like when people ask me, oh, are you a laddie? Does that mean you shouldn't vote? Hey man, if you have the capacity to vote and it matters and you're in your particular area. See, I've had a luxury other individuals don't have. I've, I'm, I don't live in a swing state, right? I could, I, could be a, I could vote for Bernie Sanders and I could write in Mickey Mouse and it's not gonna make a fucking difference. New York is never gonna vote Trump because the local people hate him, despise him, like with a passion. And I think that, you know, I don't even know if New York is a place he, it, it, listen, if he's scared to go outside of D.C., don't come outside of New York City right now, because it is a fucking war zone. Like, I went down there, and it was it was very hectic, man. So I think, look, elections aren't just going to fix that. You know, I differ with some people that think, oh, that's going to be the answer to it all. No. But, you know, for example, New York City, nothing grows here. Not, there's not a fucking carrot that grows on Central Park, all right? So everything is busted and shipped in through here. They've been blocking off highways lately. Once these protesters realize they're blocking off a highway, you could have starved this city out. Motherfuckers would be doing food drops on Riverside. At, like, right, you, you, people have to understand how far is this really going to go? How far do they really want to take it? And when people say to me, well, what is your position on that? And I say, well, that's, that's an expression of revolutionary angst without the, 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 the electoralism in it. And then people say, well, does that, was that looting, Felipe? Do you support looting? And I say, no, I don't support nobody getting hurt. Nobody should be out here beating up civilians. I've, I've been talking to um, various, I like to call them street organizations because they're not gangs. And they're on some jail shit now. Jail rules apply, which is, you know, it's, 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 a uh, it's, it's what they call selective morality, but they say, hey, you know what? We, nobody's gonna be raping nobody out here. That, that's not, you know what I mean? That those people, no child molestation, no crazy shit. You wanna be in there. We don't care about none of these businesses that haven't supported us. And then there's the catch 22. People say, well, are we destroying our own community? And I say, the sad part is that that's 100% right, right? We are, but here it is. And here it is just plain and simple. And that. And it kind of hurts to say, because when we take a step back, we have to look at all the businesses that have been set up in our community, right? Those conveniences that we have. And that was the thing that I saw today in Fordham Road when I went to the Bronx. They had put up a sign next to the check cashing spot after they bashed the door in. 
They said, you know, I'm sorry to inconvenience the people that have to use this place, but these businesses don't exist in any place but the ghetto because they know that people are not financially literate here. They know that it's mostly black and brown people. And you used to have to pay a decimo to the church. Now you got to pay 10% of your wage to these people who are taking advantage of you. Why don't they have this in a white community? Why don't they have this there? Because people won't patronize it because they won't go there. So I get that a lot of people are saying, well, you're just destroying a lot of stuff. I'm not making excuses for people that are just doing reckless, ignorant nonsense. Uh, what I'm telling people is that this is a result of people having no jobs. The stimulus check was gone two months ago. People are mad that, of course, some people are desperate and they're just taking advantage of anything. But at the same time, Everything that this government has and that they, they've collected, they've looted. And that wasn't through any election. All those natural resources that they've taken, the community developers, the people that have said, oh man, we're gonna kick you out, we're moving you out of here. You gotta get out, displacements, people losing their home to, to, to imminent domain. You know, that, that, that didn't get fought by electing people. That got fought by going to the house of the landlord and shaming them in front of that. You know, the, the, the unions, they don't just have an election, they'll set up a rat outside your spot and say this person is abusing the people. I, I, I think we gotta shame the devil. I, I'm not sure 100% how to do that, but the other part of it is, is that, you know, as long as, as, long as a person's alive, you know, you, you, got, you got insurance, you can re rebuild. But other people that lost their lives for walking on the street, or you know, there was there was two kids, those two little black kids in Atlanta who just happened to drive by what happened, right, going home and got maced and tear gassed and beaten and thrown out the car. You know, I I I can't tell you how many times in New York City, a police officer has pulled up on me and put a gun to my head. Who are you? you Search me illegally. You know, we can, can we change that? We, we've had a Democratic mayor, a Republican mayor, then a Democratic mayor. That didn't change those things, man. You know? Thank you for your question. Thank you so much for everyone's question. I'm just going to ask this and we'll go ahead and close. Uh, my question to you, Tech, is uh, what's your advice to students uh, moving forward and graduating with, uh, you know, this climate? So what kind, what's your advice to kids moving forward graduating? <laughs> Take everything you learn and apply it to something that you didn't expect it to. The job that you were imagining may not even exist, right? Like if the world is ending right now and there's some spaceships that are coming and they're going to take like a couple of million people off the planet to some colony and everyone on Earth is going to die. Imagine you're in that line and you get up there and they say, well, what do you do? And they say, uh, I'm an insurance claims adjuster. And they're like, oh, please get in the line that goes right back to Earth. Um, we've always wanted to be in a business that is, or, or, ha or serve a purpose that always is a necessity, that always needs us to be there. And no matter what, remember, when you're in one of those industries or when you're in that line of activism, there is no shortage of pain or suffering or inspiration that can be had from anything that we're seeing right now. You know, and I think in, in my life, I've, I've taken care to, to break the fourth wall, as they say, right? To talk to the audience, but also the fifth and the sixth, because we live in a three-dimensional world, which is to make other people participate and then to participate in this stuff myself. So I think that a lot of what we have to do um, is to lead by example. And I think for me, um, you know, none of this came at an opportune time for anybody. You know, I just buried my grandmother and it was a very difficult time. I lost a lot of my friends. You know, the coronavirus, you know, I, obviously I'm alive, but you know, my friend's son died. Like just all kind of crazy shit happened. Um, a friend of mine was, uh, you know, I know people that have been arrested for phony charges. So I, I'm thinking in my mind, there's, there's to me a necessity for me to participate. There's a necessity for me to use this as a lifeline 
And I would say to people that are coming out of work, just remember that um, if you're coming from a college experience, and my father told me this, he said, if you can't take everything that you learned in college, turn it around and teach it to someone, right? Teach everybody what you just learned right now. Not you have to be the best teacher in the world. They got to be you, man. You got to be the best teacher in the world. You got to be able just to give them the basics of what you know. Then you've wasted your time. You got to take what you know right now because we don't know how many more generations may actually be invested in this form of education. You know, there were 19,000 students. I live in New York City. 19,000 students for y'all that, 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 that are paying for school right now. 19,000 students are not coming back to Columbia University next semester. And you know why? Because they said, well, what are we doing? Are we doing these type of classes online? And they said, yeah, well, we're not going to have, well, what? You can't charge me $80,000 to, 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 to be on, a, you know, an iPhone chat with somebody? Like, no. And these institutions, I think a lot of us have realized, could have offered, like I said in the very beginning, the same knowledge. We could have had these type of interactions years ago. But for whatever reason, we all know the reason is because they couldn't make money off of it. And now we're living in a different world. Now we're living in a world where we're going to have to be conscientious of resources, where apply what you've learned to the possibility that you, the entire political landscape may change. You know what I mean? Invest in, in land. Learn to, learn to grow stuff for yourself. You know, that was, people say, oh, you're a rapper and you've been successful. You sold hundreds of thousands of records and you made the lion's share of it. You tore all the time. Yet, but I don't see you with diamonds and jewelry. And you're right. I'm, I'm listen, I, when people ask me about success, because I've gone to some of these, these like kind of TED talk, like uh, 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 financial conferences, and I really just go there to disrupt things. Because, you know, I, I can get people's attention by telling them that I became a millionaire when I was 25 years old. Oh, man, I did everything right in, in business. I was schooled by people. But then now look at the industry that I'm in, right? Take my example. Learn from my failures. Every thousand cap venue that people used to perform in that I would get thirty, forty thousand dollars to rock in. That's not a one thousand cap venue no more. It's now a two hundred cap venue because you can't social distance like that. There's no more meet and greets, right? But people still love my music and then I identify with what's going on because they know I'm real, I live about it, and then I'm doing stuff. Other artists have not been able to have longevity. They've not been able to transfer with the times. You know, don't just look at what your your job or career path may offer for today, think about where you'll be in 10, 20 years and what it may help you do or prepare yourself for. And like I said before, again, I'll repeat, the real teacher or the real master always wants the student to be better than them. Not exactly like them, but better at what you do. So if you're a creative artistic type, I want you to be more creative and artistic and use the pain and suffering that you've heard from me to be more creative. If you're an organizer, See the things that have worked for me. If you want to be a teacher, then recognize that I went through a painstaking way of, you know, teaching people by reliving the trauma that I did when I was locked up and learning that a lot of the kids that were uh, incarcerated that I was teaching, they weren't like hardened criminals. They were victims of abuse. That's what made them standoffish. That's what made the kids have poor impulse control and go to violence as the go-to. These are kids that have been emotionally abused, sexually abused, psychologically abused, physically abused. You know what I mean? What, why else would a fucking 10 year old want to stab you, huh? Cause nobody respects a kid when he says, don't touch me, leave me alone, please don't hurt me. But you are forced to respect the fucking baby if he pulls out a fucking knife and says, hey, my nigga, if you fucking touch me again, I'll fucking kill you. And in that heartbeat, that heartbeat, the kid has learned the long lesson. He thinks the knife is what makes him powerful. It's not what makes him powerful. The fact that he just learned to use his voice, that's what makes him powerful, right? So remember what they told me when I was writing rhymes in jail and what Judge told me. Take the, take the, take the pen and write your story right? Write your story. Because if you don't write your story, 
somebody else gonna write it for you and they're gonna make you look however they wanted to make you look. And that's the gem I can leave you with. And you know what I mean? I love y'all.